When we enter deeply into the life of the soul from the aspect we intend to follow up here, we are repeatedly reminded of the ancient saying of the Greek sage Heraclitus, quote, Never will you find the boundaries of the soul by whatever paths you search. So all-embracing is the soul's being. Close quote. We shall be speaking here of the soul and its life, not from the standpoint of current psychology, but from that of spiritual science. Spiritual science stands firmly for the real existence of a spiritual world behind all that is revealed to the senses and through them to the mind. It regards this spiritual world as the source and foundation of external existence and holds that the investigation of it lies within the reach of human beings. In lectures given here, the difference between spiritual science and the many other standpoints of the present day has often been cited, and we shall mention them only briefly. In ordinary life and in ordinary science, it is usually assumed that human knowledge has certain boundaries, and that because these boundaries happen to have been set for us, the human mind cannot know anything beyond them. Some people who do not want to reject a supersensible world altogether may say, we should let this spiritual world be because, made as we are, we human beings cannot reach beyond the physical world, and at most can only conceive of intellectual ideas, hypotheses, concerning what exists behind this physical world. Other people, developing this view further, may say that a supersensible world is of no concern to us, whatever. But spiritual science does not see things this way. On the contrary, It maintains that the contents of the universe are infinite, and human knowledge of it depends on human beings having the organs for it. People would never have hit upon the idea that there is a world filled with color and light if they did not have eyes, nor would they have imagined a world filled with sounds if they did not have ears. With each new organ, with each opportunity for further perception, a new facet, a new realm of the world opens up. So spiritual science holds that these boundaries of human knowing can only be temporary and can be extended. For our soul contains hidden faculties which we can draw forth. And then, just as people born blind who gain their sight through an operation emerge from darkness into a world of light and color, so it is with people whose hidden faculties awaken. They will break through into a spiritual world which is always around us, but cannot be directly known until the appropriate spiritual organs for perceiving it have been developed. Instead of pointing to any boundaries to knowledge, spiritual science asks how we are to transform ourselves in order to reach further and further into this world, and to acquire a more and more comprehensive experience of it. And spiritual science refers us again and again to the great event which enables a person to become a spiritual investigator and see in the spiritual world just as a physicist sees in the physical world with the aid of a microscope. This is what Goethe was referring to with the words, quote, Secretly in the light of day, nature's veil may not be lifted, what e'er to your inquiring spirit she will not reveal freely, you cannot forcibly extract it, not with levers, not with screws. Close quote. Of course, the spiritual, scientific investigator has no such instruments to aid him. He has to transform the soul itself into an instrument. Then he experiences on a higher level a similar great moment when his soul is awakened and he can see into a spiritual world, as do blind people when, having been operated on, they look at a world they have not seen before. Again, it has often been emphasized here that not everyone needs to be a spiritual investigator in order to appreciate what an awakened soul can communicate. 
For when knowledge resulting from spiritual research is given out, no more is required of the listener than ordinary logic and an unbiased sense of truth. Investigation requires the opened eyes of a clairvoyant. Recognition of what is communicated requires a sound sense of truth, natural feeling, unclouded by prejudice, and normal common sense. The point is that teachings and observations concerning the soul should be understood in the light of this spiritual research when in the following lectures we begin speaking about some of the characteristics of the soul of interest to people. Just as anyone who wants to study hydrogen, oxygen or any other chemical substance has to acquire certain capabilities, so is observation of the life of the soul possible only to someone whose spiritual eyes have been opened. The investigator of the soul must be in a position to make observations in in soul substance, so to speak. We must certainly not think of the soul as something vague and nebulous in which feelings, thoughts and impulses are whirling about. Let us rather remind ourselves of what has been said on this subject in previous lectures. When we look at a human being, we see a far more complicated being than is accepted by exoteric science. For spiritual science, the knowledge drawn from external physical observation covers only a part of our being, the outer physical body which we have in common with all our mineral surroundings. Here the same laws apply and the same substances function as in the external physical mineral world. As a result of observation, however, and not merely on the strength of logical inference, spiritual science recognizes over and above the physical body a second member of the human being, what we call the etheric body or life body. Only brief reference can be made here today to the structure of the human organism, for on this occasion our task is quite a different one, but knowledge of this underlying structure is the foundation on which we have to build. Human beings have an etheric body in common with everything that is alive. Our physical, mineral surroundings do not have life, and it is only the spiritual researcher who has transformed his soul into an instrument for seeing into the spiritual world who can directly observe this etheric body. But with a healthy sense of truth, unclouded by today's prejudices, anyone can recognize its existence. Referring again to our physical body, which harbors the same physical and chemical laws as does the external physical mineral world, we can ask when do we see the actual nature of these laws? We see them when a human being has ceased to have life. When a human being has passed through the gate of death, then we see what the laws that govern the physical body are really like. They are the laws that lead to the decomposition of the body, and their effect on it is then quite different from their action during life. They are always present in the physical body, but the reason why the human body does not obey them is that between birth and death an antagonist of dissolution is active there, the etheric or life body. We can distinguish a third member, too, of the human organism, the carrier of pleasure and sorrow, joy and pain, of urges, desires and passions, of everything we call our psychological or mental life. The carrier, please note, but not the actual soul itself. Human beings have this in common with all those creatures who possess a certain form of consciousness, namely the animals. Astral body or body of consciousness is the name we give to this third member of the human organism. This completes what we call the bodily nature of the human being. This has three components, physical body, etheric body or life body, astral body or consciousness body. Within these three members, we can distinguish further the spark which makes man the crown of creation and which he has in common with nothing else. 
It has often been remarked that our language has one little word which points directly to this inner core of man, which makes him the crown of earth creation. These flowers here, the desk, the clock, anyone can name these objects. But there is one word we can never hear spoken by another with reference to ourselves. It is expressed by the little name of capital I. Think for a moment about whether the word I can come to you from outside, if it means yourself. If you are to call yourself I, this I must sound forth from within yourself and designate your inmost being. This is why the great religions and world views have always regarded this name as the, quote, unspeakable name, close quote, of that which cannot be named from outside. Indeed, with this designation, I, we reach the innermost being of a person, which can be called the godlike element in him. We are not thereby making him into a god. If we say that the I is of a similar substance to the godlike creative substance that weaves and pulsates through the world, we are no more making the I into a god than we are making a drop of water into the whole ocean by saying that the drop is similar in substance to the ocean. By virtue of this actual inner core of their being, human beings are subject to a certain phenomenon which spiritual science treats as absolutely serious and real. Its very name fascinates people today, but in its application to the human being, It is only fully accepted by spiritual science. It is the fact of existence that we call evolution. What a fascinating effect this word has on modern people when they point to lower forms of life which have gradually evolved to higher stages and equally enchanting when it can be said that human beings themselves have evolved from lower forms of existence to their present pinnacle. Spiritual science takes evolution seriously, particularly where man is concerned. It calls attention to the fact that just because human beings possess a consciousness of self and have an inner activity that springs from the center of their being, they should not only look outward to the world and understand evolution to be merely a progression of less perfect organisms toward more perfect ones, but as active beings themselves They have to evolve. Our idea of evolution must not stop at what has happened up to this point. But we have to realize that human beings must themselves undergo further evolution. They have to go beyond the stage they have now reached and continue to develop new forces and make themselves more and more perfect and whole. Spiritual science would like to use a term first formulated not very long ago, and which is now recognized as valid in another realm, and apply it on a higher level to human evolution. Most people today are not aware that as late as the beginning of the 17th century, professional people as well as lay people believed that the lower animals simply arose out of mud. This belief was based on inexact observation. And it was the great natural scientist Francesco Redi who, in the 17th century, first championed the statement, Life can only arise from the living. Note well, this quotation comes with all today's reservations. Of course, nobody would believe nowadays that any lower animal at all, an earthworm, for instance, can grow out of mud. For an earthworm to come into existence, the germ of an earthworm has to be there. And yet in the 17th century, Francesco Redi only narrowly escaped the fate of Giordano Bruno, for his statement had made him a tremendous heretic. This sort of treatment is not usually inflicted on heretics today, at least not in all parts of the world. But there is a modern equivalent of it. If anyone upholds something which contradicts the belief of those who, in their arrogance, suppose they have attained the pinnacle of earthly wisdom, they are looked on as visionaries, dreamers, if not as something worse. This is the present form of the Inquisition in our parts of the world. 
so be it. What spiritual science has to say regarding phenomena on higher levels will have to go the same way as the statement of Francesco Redi concerning a lower level. Just as he asserted that life can issue only from the living, spiritual science states that, quote, soul and spirit can issue only from soul and spirit, close quote. And the law of reincarnation, the actual consequence of this statement, is often ridiculed nowadays as the outcome of fantasy run wild. Many people still believe today, when they see from the very first day of a child's life the soul and spirit element developing out of the bodily element, increasingly definite facial traits emerging from an undifferentiated physiognomy, movements becoming more and more individual, talents and abilities appearing. They still believe that all this comes from the inherited line of the child's ancestors, down through father, mother, grandparents, and so on. This belief derives from inexact observation, just as does the belief that earthworms originate from mud. Present-day sense observation is incapable of tracing back to its soul-spiritual origin the soul and spirit that are manifest before our eyes today. Therefore, the laws of physical heredity are made to account for phenomena which apparently emerge from the obscure depths of the physical part of our being. Spiritual science looks back to previous lives on earth. When the talents and characteristics that are evident in the present life were foreshadowed. And it regards the present life as the source of new formative influences that will bear fruit in future lives. Soul and spirit can issue only from soul and spirit. The time is not far distant when this statement will have become as obvious a truth as the statement of Francesco Redi, life can issue only from the living, has become since the 17th century but its effect will be very different. Whereas Reddy's statement is of restricted interest, the statement of spiritual science, quote, soul and spirit uh, can issue only from soul and spirit, close quote, concerns everyone. That a human being does not live once only, but passes through repeated lives on earth, every life being the result of earlier lives and the starting point of numerous subsequent lives, is the kind of knowledge that interests everyone. All confidence in life, all certainty in our work, the solution of all the riddles facing us, they all depend on knowing this. People will draw more and more strength from this knowledge for coping with their lives and for confidence and hope in facing the future. Now, what is it that is at work in one incarnation after another? that took its start in earlier lives and reappears every time we come to the earth. It is the human, capital I, designated in our language by a name unutterable by anyone outside ourselves. The human ego goes from life to life, and in doing so it accomplishes its evolution. But how does this evolution proceed? By the ego working on the three lower members of the human being, There is the astral body, the vehicle of pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, instinct, desire and passion. Let us look at a person on a low level, whose ego has done little as yet to cleanse his astral body, and so is still its slave. In a person on a higher level we find that his ego has worked upon his astral body, so that his lower instincts, desires and passions have been transformed into moral ideals, ethical judgments. From this contrast we can gain a first impression of how the ego works on the astral body. In every human being it is possible to distinguish the part of the astral body on which their ego has not yet worked and the part which the ego has consciously transformed. The transmuted part is called spirit self or manas. The ego is able to become even stronger and it will then also transmute the etheric body. Life-spirit is the name given to the transformed part of the etheric body. 
And if the ego acquires such strength that it is able to extend its transforming power as far as the physical body, we call the transmuted part Atma, or the real spirit man. This is how evolution takes place. The outer members of the human being, which are not actively acquired but given, are transformed by the ego. So far we have been speaking of the conscious transforming of the astral body. But in the far distant past, before the ego was capable of working in this conscious way, it worked unconsciously, or rather subconsciously, on the three outer sheaths, beginning with the astral body, the carrier of our emotions, desires and instincts. The part of the astral body that the ego worked on in this way, this transmuted part of the astral body, we call the first member of the human soul, the sentient soul. This is how the ego lives in our inner being. And it created the sentient soul at a time when human beings lacked the requisite degree of consciousness for transforming their instincts, desires and so forth. In the etheric or life body, the ego created, before the age of consciousness, what we call the rational or perceptive soul, footnote, rational soul or perceptive soul, are my rendering of Verstandesseele and Gemütsseele, which have been customarily translated as intellectual soul and mind soul, translator, end of footnote. And in the physical body, the ego created the inner organ we call the consciousness soul, For spiritual science, the human soul is not a vague, nebulous entity, but an essential part of our inner being, consisting of three distinct members, sentient soul, rational or perceptive soul, and consciousness soul, within all of which the ego is actively engaged. Let us try to form an idea of these three members. The spiritual investigator knows them from direct observation but we can approach them also by means of rational thinking. For instance, suppose we have a rose in front of us. We perceive it. And as long as we perceive it, we are receiving an impression from outside. We call this the percept of the rose. The moment we turn our eyes away, we retain an inner image of it. Something remains that we can take away with us, a picture of the rose. We must distinguish these two moments the moment when we are looking at the rose and the moment when we are able to retain an image of it as an inner possession, although we are no longer perceiving it. This point must be emphasized because of the incredible notions brought up in this connection by 19th century philosophers. We need only think of Schopenhauer, whose philosophy begins with the words, the world is my idea. So we have to be clear as to the difference between percepts and concepts, mental images. The concept is not the same as the percept. Any sane person knows the difference between the concept of white hot steel, which cannot burn them, and white hot steel itself, which can. Perceptions, excuse me, perception, brings us into communication with the external world. Concepts belong to the soul. The boundary between inner experience and the outer world can be precisely drawn. Directly we begin to experience something inwardly, we owe it to the sentient soul, as distinct from the sentient body, which brings us our percepts and enables us to perceive, for example, the rose and its color. Concepts are located in the sentient soul, which is also the bearer of all that we call our sympathies and antipathies, of the feelings that things arouse in us. When we feel the rose to be beautiful, this is an inward experience belonging to the sentient soul. Anyone who is unwilling to distinguish percepts from concepts should remember that a real white-hot piece of steel burns and the mental image of it does not. Once, when I said this, someone objected that people might be able to suggest to themselves the thought of lemonade so vividly that they would experience the taste on their tongue. To which I replied, certainly this might be possible, but whether the imaginary lemonade would quench their thirst is another matter. 
we can always draw the line between external reality and inner experience. Directly inner experience begins, the sentient soul, as distinct from the sentient body, comes into play. The higher principle brought into being by the work of the ego on the etheric body is what we call the rational or perceptive soul. We shall be speaking about this in the lecture on the mission of truth, whereas today we are especially concerned with the sentient soul. Through the rational or perceptive soul, human beings are enabled to do more than carry about with them the experiences aroused in them by their perceptions of the outer world. They take these experiences a stage further. Instead of merely keeping their perceptions alive as images in the sentient soul, they reflect on them and involve themselves with them until these form themselves into thoughts and judgments, into the whole content of a person's inner life. The inner cultivation of impressions received from the outer world is the work of what we call the rational or perceptive soul. A third principle is brought into being when the ego has created in the physical body the organs whereby it is enabled to go out from itself and to connect once again its judgments and ideas with the external world. This principle we call the consciousness soul because the ego is then able to turn the inner experiences aroused in it by the stimuli from outside into conscious knowledge of this outer world. When we give form to the feelings we experience so that they enlighten us concerning the outer world, then the content of our minds becomes actual knowledge of the outer world. It is by means of the consciousness soul that we fathom the mysteries of the outer world, that we become knowledgeable people. All the time it is the ego that is working unceasingly at these three members of the human soul. And the more it achieves in releasing forces lodged there and in making these three soul members more and more competent, the further human beings advance in their evolution. The ego is the active agent with whose help human beings not only acquire an understanding of evolution, but can participate in it, progressing from life to life, remedying the defects of former lives, and widening their faculties of soul. Human evolution, as it advances from one incarnation to another, starts with the work of the ego on the three members of the human soul. However, we must realize that as it works, the ego has the character of a two-edged sword. Yes, the human ego is, on the one hand, the very element of our being which enables us to be truly human. If we did not have this center, we should merge passively with the outer world. This is where we have to take hold of our thoughts, experience a greater and greater number of them, and continually enrich our minds through impressions from the outer world. We become more and more human the larger our ego becomes. Therefore the ego has to go on increasing and become the sort of center through which human beings not only take their place in the outer world, but actively inspire others. The richer the fund of their impulses, the more human beings have absorbed the more they give of their individual selves, the more they approach being truly human. This is one aspect of the ego, and we are duty-bound to endeavor to make our ego as rich and many-sided as we can. But there is also a, a reverse side of this progress of the ego, and this is called selfishness or egoism. If these words were taken as catchwords, and it were said that human beings must become selfless, that would of course be bad, as any use of catchwords is. It is indeed the task of human beings to enrich themselves inwardly, but this does not imply a selfish hardening of the ego and a shutting off of themselves and their riches from the world. In that event, human beings would indeed become richer and richer, but they would lose their connection with the world. Their enrichment would signify that the world had no more to give them, and they nothing to give the world. In the course of time they would perish, 
for while striving to enrich their ego, they would be keeping it all for themselves and would become isolated from the world. This caricature of ego development would impoverish the human ego to an increasing extent, for selfishness lays waste a person's inner being. So it is that the ego, as it works in the three members of the soul, acts as a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it must work to increase itself in content and form, becoming a more and more powerful center from which a great deal can radiate. Yet it must bring everything it absorbs back into harmony with its surroundings. To the same degree that it develops its own resources, it must go out from itself and connect with the whole of existence. It must become simultaneously an independent being and a selfless one. Only when the ego works in these two apparently contradictory directions, when on the one hand it enriches itself increasingly and on the other side becomes selfless, can human evolution go forward so as to be both satisfying for the individual and of benefit to the welfare and progress of all existence. The ego has to work on each of the three soul members in such a way that in both these directions justice is done where human evolution is concerned. But the very work of the human eye, capital in the soul, leads to its own gradual weakening, excuse me, gradual awakening. Wherever there is life, there is development, and we find that the various members of the human soul are today at different stages of development. The sentient soul, the bearer of our emotions and impulses and of all the feelings that are aroused by direct stimuli from the world of the senses, is the most strongly developed of the three. And in our sentient soul this is experienced at certain lower levels of development in a dull sort of way. And here the ego has not yet awakened to full existence. Not until our soul life continues on its way and the human being works further on itself does the I become more and more distinct and conscious of itself. But as far as the sentient soul is awake, the ego is only a brooding presence within it. The ego only gains in clarity when human beings advance to the richer life of the rational soul, and it is clearest of all in the consciousness soul. Here it becomes aware of itself as an individual distinguishing itself from the outer world and acquiring objective knowledge of it. This is possible only in the consciousness soul. So the ego is only dimly awake in the sentient soul. It is swept along by waves of pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, and can hardly be seen as an entity. In the rational soul, when clearly defined ideas and judgments are arrived at, the ego makes strides in gaining clarity and becomes clearest of all in the consciousness soul. So we can conclude that human beings have a duty to educate themselves and to grasp the opportunity the ego gives of furthering their own evolution. Yet at the moment of its awakening, the ego is still at the mercy of the waves of emotion that surge through the sentient soul. Is there anything in the sentient soul that can contribute in any way to the education of the ego at a time when the ego is still unskilled? We shall see in the rational soul something gaining ground which enables the ego to take its own education in hand, whilst in the sentient soul this is not yet available. The ego must be guided by something which arises independently in the sentient soul. We shall single out this one element, this one force in the sentient soul, and look at the part it plays in educating the ego in two ways. This force which is more likely to cause offense is what we call anger. Anger belongs to the kind of thing that arises in the sentient soul because the ego is still dormant there. 
Or can it be said that we are in conscious control of ourselves if someone else's behavior drives us to flare up in anger? Let us picture the difference between two people who are, let us say, teachers. The one has achieved the clarity which makes for enlightened inner judgments. He keeps perfectly calm when his pupil does something naughty because he has a perceptive soul that is mature. In his consciousness soul, too, he is calmly aware of the child's shortcomings, and if necessary he can prescribe a suitable punishment in accordance with ethical and pedagogical judgment without losing his temper. It will be difficult in the case of the teacher whose ego has not reached the point where he can stay calm and clear-headed and think out what to do when a child does the unexpected. So what he does is flare up in anger over the child's bad behavior. Is such anger always inappropriate where events in the outer world are concerned? No, not always. And this is something we must keep in mind. Before we are capable of judging an event in the light of the rational soul or the consciousness soul, the wisdom of evolution has provided for us to react to the event with emotion. Something in our sentient soul is activated as a result of the deed taking place outside. We are not yet capable of finding the appropriate judgment, but we are capable of reacting from the emotional center of the soul. So from among everything that the sentient soul experiences, let us take a special look at anger. It is a herald of something that will come later on. First we judge an event in the outer world by getting angry. Then, having first learned unconsciously to disagree with something that is not right, learning unconsciously by way of anger, we learn, through this very way of judging, to become more and more ready in the higher part of our souls to have enlightened judgment. So in a certain area, anger is an educator. It arises in us as an inner experience before we are mature enough to form an enlightened judgment about something unacceptable to us. This is how we should look at the anger which can overcome young people before they are capable of considered judgment at sight of an unjust or foolish action which violates their ideals. We are justified in calling this righteous anger It is a dimly recognized judgment made by the sentient soul before we are mature enough to pass enlightened judgment. Indeed, we learn by means of anger to acquire light-filled clarity. For no one does better at acquiring self-assured judgment than a person who, starting from the right feelings, has passed through the stage of being moved to righteous anger by anything mean, immoral, or senseless. This is the mission of anger. Anger has the mission to raise the human ego to higher levels. Before we can master ourselves and judge clearly, it leads us by means of what we can do to what we cannot yet do. Of course, since man is to become a free being, everything in the human being can degenerate, even this force that can educate us to freedom and independent judgment. Anger can degenerate into rage and serve to gratify the worst kind of egoism. This must be so if human beings are to be able to develop freedom. But what we must not fail to realize but excuse me, but we must not fail to realize that the very thing which can become evil may, when it shows its proper nature, have the mission of assisting our progress. It is just because human beings can allow good to turn into evil that something which has been developed into a good quality can become a possession of the ego. Therefore anger is to be understood as the herald of the force that can raise a human being to calm self-possession. But, strangely enough, although anger is on the one hand an educator of the ego, It also shows us that it develops the other quality of the ego, unselfishness. 
What is the ego's response when anger overpowers us at the sight of injustice and stupidity? By getting angry we assert ourselves against what is outside us. The whole content of the ego is involved. If the sight of injustice were not to kindle righteous anger in us, we would remain passive and not feel the ego being spurred to respond. Anger awakens the ego and summons it to confront the world. Yet at the same time it induces selflessness. When anger is of the kind we can call righteous, its effect is to damp down the ego feeling. If we are feeling real anger and not rage, then something like powerlessness overtakes the soul and the ego becomes duller and duller. This actual experience of anger is wonderfully well brought out in the German vernacular use of sich giften, to poison oneself, as a phrase meaning to get angry. This is an example of how popular imagination arrives at the experience of a truth which may often elude the learned. Anger which eats into the soul is a poison which damps down the ego's self-awareness. Yet the very expression of it points to the other factor it promotes, namely selflessness. So we see how anger serves to teach both independence and selflessness. And that is its dual mission as an educator of humankind, before the ego is ripe to undertake its own education. We would just melt into nothing if we had to remain indifferent to everything around us, and we could not judge it calmly. And we would not become selfless, but in the worst sense dependent, with no ego, unless, before we developed enlightened judgment, we could not use anger to achieve independence when the outer world jars on our inner being. And this anger is, for the spiritual scientist, also the herald of something quite different. Life shows us that a person who is unable to flare up in righteous anger at injustice or stupidity will never acquire real love and kindness whereas a person who educates himself through righteous anger will acquire a heart aglow with love, a heart that leads to the doing of good deeds. Love and kindness are the obverse of righteous anger. Anger that is conquered and purified becomes transformed into love and kindness. A loving hand is seldom one that is never clenched in response to injustice or foolishness. Anger and love are complementary. A superficial theosophy might say, yes, indeed, people must overcome their passions. They must purge and purify them. But overcoming something does not mean avoiding it or ducking it. It is a strange way of making an offering to cast off one's passionate nature by evading it. We can only give away something that is ours in the first place. Anger can be overcome only by those who have first experienced it in themselves. For we have to have something first before we can overcome it. When we transmute anger and ascend from the element of sentient soul, where righteous anger can flare up to the rational and consciousness soul, then this anger will become transformed into loving kindness and a hand that brings blessing. Transmuted anger is living love. This is what reality tells us. Anger in moderation has the mission to lead human beings to love. We can call it the teacher of love. And not without reason do we call the undefined power that flows forth from the wisdom of the world and shows itself in the writing of wrongs, divine wrath, in contrast to divine love. But we know, too, that these two belong together and that one cannot exist without the other. In life they determine one another. Now let us see how art and poetry, when they rise to greater heights, show us archetypal world wisdom. And just as when we come to speak of the mission of truth, we shall show how Goethe's thoughts on this subject are clearly expressed in his title Pandora, one of his finest poems, though small in scale. There is also, albeit a less clear example, a powerful poem of world importance, the title 
Prometheus Bound by Aeschylus, in which we encounter the role of anger as a phenomenon in world history. You probably know the legend on which Aeschylus based his drama. Prometheus is a descendant of the ancient race of Titans, who succeeded the first generation of gods Greek mythology tells of in the evolution of the earth and of humankind. Uranus and Uranus and Gaia belong to the first generation of gods. Uranus is succeeded by Kronos, Saturn. Then the Titans are overthrown by the third generation of gods, led by Zeus. Prometheus, though a descendant of the Titans, was on the side of Zeus in the battle against the Titans, and so, we, and so can be called a friend of Zeus, but only half a friend. When Zeus took over the rulership of the earth, the legend continues, the human race had advanced far enough to enter on a new phase, while the old faculties human beings possessed in ancient times were dying out. Zeus wanted to exterminate humankind and install a new race on earth, but Prometheus resolved to give human beings the means of further progress. He brought them speech, writing, knowledge of the outer world, and finally fire, so that by learning to master these gifts, humanity might raise themselves again from the low level to which they had fallen. If we look more deeply into the story, we find that everything bestowed by Prometheus on humankind is connected with the human ego, while Zeus, if we understand the Greek legend correctly, is represented as a divine power which leads soul and spirit to human beings in whom an ego has not yet come to expression. Going back in the earth's evolution, we find a humanity in whom the ego was no more than an obscurely brooding presence. It had to acquire certain definite faculties with which to educate itself. The gifts that Zeus could bestow at that time were not adapted to furthering the progress of humankind. In respect of the astral body and of everything in the human being apart from the ego, Zeus is the giver. It was because Zeus was not capable of promoting the development of the ego that he resolved to wipe out humanity, whereas all the gifts brought by Prometheus enabled the ego to educate itself. This is the deeper meaning of the legend. It is Prometheus who enables human beings to make their ego independent and continuously enrich and enlarge it. And this is exactly how the gifts bestowed by Prometheus are understood in ancient Greece. But what we have just become aware of is that if the ego were to have only this one goal, it would after all become impoverished in due course, for it would be shutting itself off from the outer world. Enriching itself is only one aspect of the ego. If it does not want to become impoverished, it must, excuse me, it has to share its wealth and relate harmoniously with others. Prometheus would give human beings only the one gift that enhances the ego more and more. So inevitably he was challenging the very powers that act from out of the entire cosmos to subdue the ego in the right way, so that it may become selfless and thus develop its other aspect. The independence of the ego achieved through the sting of anger on the one hand, and on the other the damping down of the ego when it is consumed by anger. This whole process is presented in the historic pictures of the conflict between Prometheus and Zeus. Prometheus brings the ego those faculties which enable it to become richer and richer. What Zeus has to do is to introduce the same effect that anger has in the individual. Therefore the wrath of Zeus falls upon what Prometheus is doing and extinguishes the power of the ego in him. The legend tells us that Zeus punishes Prometheus for the ultimately, excuse me, for the untimely stimulus he has given to the advancement of the ego. He is chained to a rock. The suffering endured by the ego of mankind and its inner rebellion are magnificently expressed in this poetic drama by Aeschylus. So we see the representative of the human ego subdued by the wrath of Zeus.
just as the individual human ego is checked and driven back into itself when it has to swallow its anger and is in this way reduced to its proper proportions, So is Prometheus chained by the wrath of Zeus, meaning that his activity is reduced to its proper level. Just as the individual ego, when it exults in its ego nature, becomes fettered when anger floods the soul, in a similar way the ego of Prometheus is chained to the rock when anger suppresses his ego consciousness. The particular merit of this legend is that it presents in such powerful pictures far-reaching truths which are valid both for individuals and for the whole of humankind. Its special quality is that it shows us in pictures what has to be experienced in the human soul. And in Prometheus, chained to the Caucasian rock, we can see a representative of the human ego striving to advance from its brooding somnolence in the soul being restrained by its fetters in order to curb its anger. We are then told that Prometheus knows the wrath of Zeus will be silenced if he is overthrown by the son of a mortal. He will be succeeded in his rulership by someone born of mortal man. On a lower plane, the ego is released by the mission of anger, and on a higher plane, the immortal ego, the immortal soul, will be born from mortal man. And just as Prometheus looks forward to the one who will succeed Zeus, who brought anger down upon him so that it did not reach beyond its bounds, just as Prometheus looks forward to the coming of Christ Jesus. Similarly, the individual ego that was fettered by anger will be transformed into the loving ego, into the power of love, which is righteous anger transformed. We see coming forth from the ego fettered by anger, the ego whose actions will bring love and blessing to the world, just as we see the coming of a God of love who cultivates the ego, the very ego that in an earlier age, through the wrath of the god Zeus, had to be chained so that it should not transgress its proper bounds. What we are actually seeing in the continuation of this legend is an external picture of human evolution. We must recognize this myth ourselves and see it as a living picture, universally relevant, of how the individual experiences the transformation of the ego, educated by the mission of anger, into the liberated ego that brings forth love. If we can see it this way, then we shall understand what prompted the legend and what Aeschylus made of the material. We shall be moved to our very souls and we shall sense the truth of it in the whole course of the Prometheus legend and in the dramatic form given to it by Aeschylus. Indeed, we virtually find in this Greek drama something like a practical application of processes we can experience in our own souls. This is true of all great poems and of great works of art altogether, that they spring from typical experiences of the human soul. We have seen today how the ego is educated through the purification of an emotion. In the next lecture we shall see how the ego becomes mature enough to educate itself in the rational or perceptive soul by understanding the mission of truth on a higher level. Our study today has shown us too that the practical presentation of the Greek legend also bears out the words of Heraclitus, quote, You will never find the boundaries of the soul. By whatever paths you search for them, so wide and deep is the soul's being. Close quote. It is so, indeed, that the soul's being is so far-reaching that we cannot directly sound its depths. But spiritual science with the opened eye of the seer does indeed lead into the substance of the soul, and we can progress further and further in our fathoming of the mysterious being that the human soul is when we look at it to the eyes of the spiritual scientist. On the one hand, we can certainly say, the soul has unfathomable depths. But if we take this statement in full earnest, we can add, even if the boundaries of the soul are so extensive that we have to search for them along all possible paths, we can also hope that by extending these boundaries ourselves, 
we shall advance further and further in our knowledge of the soul. This ray of hope will illumine our search for knowledge if we accept the actual words of Heraclitus not with resignation but with confidence. The boundaries of the soul are so wide that you may search along every path and not reach them. So comprehensive is the being of the soul. Let us try to understand this comprehensive being. It will lead us further and further toward a solution of the riddle of existence. <laughs>